Welcome to another week of The Career. I'm really excited about this one. Hey, Greg. Hey, Jonah. How are you? I'm great because this week we're talking with Alex Roy. And for those of you that for some reason don't know him, he's, gosh, he's, he's Mr. Mobility. He's a cannonball run record holder. He's a source of all things AV. Uh, and he's also got a, a brand new venture fund, NIVC, where he's working around the thesis that he's calling Narrative Command about how Successful companies need to really own the conversation about their entire category. So um, this one's a really fun conversation. So I, I can't wait to get to that. But uh, what, what else is in stock today, Greg? Well, I said the other thing about Alex that's worth knowing is uh, I believe he's the one who coined the phrase universal basic mobility, or at least he's the first person I know who's ever talked about it. So he's, um, he's a natural phrase coiner. He, he really is. Yes. Um, well, before we get into it, I, I think Jonah, you should take a quick victory lap here for your kite scooplet from last episode <laughs> here. Shortly thereafter, you sort of uh, voiced your suspicions. TechCrunch and others uh, swooped in with some actual shoe leather reporting there. So I'm curious. I'm curious your take on what else. What else have you heard? Um, yeah, it was fun to see that get picked up by TechCrunch and then like the SF Examiner and, and uh, do the rounds. But uh, yeah, now, now little little birdies are telling me that uh, you know it's not just that they're closing a lot of their markets now, but they're trying to, to fight on by doing a, a cram down round. So um, classic uh, VC shenanigans, but uh, you know, got to, got to fight the good fight, I guess. I would say the good fight was there to be fought when you had Zerp going on, but yeah, these days it's crammed <laughs> down all the way down. Well, you've also been busy because how was the hungry summit? The, the panel you had with sweet green zip line and starship is exactly the one that I would have wanted to hosted. So what did we learn? The hungry summit was delicious. Um, yeah. Shout out to Matt Newberg for that one. Um, I can't wait to kind of post a recap article about uh, our conversation, but, uh, yeah, it's fun when you get kind of three humans representing three very different machines on a panel, uh, each one with kind of different approach to regulation, to how visible it is to the consumer, if it needs to be this bubbly thing that you see on the street and want to befriend, or if it's just like a machine in the background making salads. Um, so very different approaches for different problems. Uh, and then the rest of the event was just fascinating, you know, gut hacking and, restaurant operations and got to try some fun new future foods. So uh, yum, yum. But uh, I mean, you've been busy too, Greg. You got a new report out, no? I, I do. I've teased it multiple times. I um, Yeah, my essay in uh, the next edition, the new edition of Emerging Real Estate Trends, published by PwC and the Urban Land Institute is out. It's up on Medium. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, I did not make it to Vegas for the fall meetings this week, but uh, the big takeaway for me, I guess, out of it is it's really interesting that you and I and, and our listeners talk about this and look at the sort of fusion of technology and desire and delivery in this. But for real estate folks, like it's a crazy thing to like not see things in these narrow silos of like retail, industrial, office, et cetera. So for them, like this was like news they could use my writing my little essay. Mm. I think anybody listening would find it kind of unremarkable or maybe like tied up in 800 words. But, um, but the other thing that jumped out for those who do not want to read a like you know 135 page report by PwC on this <laughs> um, is it is interesting that um, that that um, the same sort of flight to quality that's happened with office post pandemic maybe not the same level of like distress assets that's been happening but the same way that everyone's sort of abandoned class C and class B office space to go for the latest and greatest is they are predicting now going to happen in industrial facilities as well because like you know there's been a lot of overbuilding in the post pandemic years for this huge surge in demand. And um, yeah, and that basically, I don't know, lot, lots of interest in like wellness for warehouses. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that works, mm. but um, but a big factor was location, location, location for same day delivery. So yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's it, this trend has become so obvious that even the real estate people have begun to sit up and take notice. <laughs> and then when you say industrial, you're thinking like light industrial for warehouse logistics kind of uses the- uh... Yeah, that's a catch all phrase and over the real estate world it includes data centers too. So that's a whole other piece of it. But, but yeah, Particularly for distribution, that last mile, all this, all those sorts of things there. So not just manufacturing and production facilities, but anything that gets involved in the supply chain fits over there too. Cool, 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 yeah. cool. Well, uh, check it out, folks. Read that one. Um, but uh, if, if that's uh, news on the ground, we got some news in the sky too, right? 
Very nice, Vlad. Well, this harkens back to our to our our favorite days picking up its picking its spacks. So, uh, not sure exactly how to tease the right news, but it is interesting. I'll start with this: that the Federal Aviation Administration, which has become noticeably friendlier as of late to electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, announced finalish rules that will permit their use going forward, like clearing out those regulatory roadblocks. So, of course, right on cue, we have one that runs right out of money. So, Jonah, who is it this week who is run out of money? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, so the FAA rules were the first time in, I think, 80 years there was a new category. So, you know, basically since the helicopter was invented. Um, and uh, it's not enough to save Lilium. Um, so <laughs> it's a tough timing, although I would say Lilium is German, so they might not have been waiting so much on U.S. approval. The US, EU has been a little friendlier in this regard, but uh, either way, apparently it's tough to <laughs> make a flying car business, no? Evidently, no matter how much money you raise, I guess, you know, I think it's a, yeah, context that you and I are unfamiliar with. I guess the deal fell apart for them where they were going to raise a new round, but without the state of Bavaria backstopping their loan, that was the end for them. So they're apparently going through, it seems like a quite orderly, uh, you know, sort of d dissolution process there where maybe it will return when the assets and the operating business get picked up. But, but yeah, the Bavarians are nothing if not orderly. That is for sure. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure our, our friends in Munich are picking through the pieces right now. But interestingly <laughs> enough, so then the next domino to fall on this is Joby, which is an actual public SPAC company from several concern, years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. Uh, they announced they were going to do a two hundred million dollars secondary offering, and markets absolutely hated that. Their stock dropped, I think, fifteen percent right after it. Uh, no one wants to hear that you need more money right now, and so I just think it's fascinating here that like the the race is on. Can you reach viability after you know all these years? And and to me, this is particularly funny, Jonah. Like I wrote a piece almost twenty years ago about um, very light jets and and the previous generation of this kind of stuff. And man, if you have to wait on the FAA for approvals it's a pretty tough road there you just never know when you're actually going to get that business going so so we'll see we'll see how I like very well, light jet sounds like it should be a, a brian eno remix album but um well uh, uh, the other joke to make here is like how long is your runway when you're in EPTOL? <laughs> like you don't really have a long runway in general as part of the operating business but i guess hey we'll see here <laughs> yes the um, jokes write themselves but no i mean i think yes jo joby's stock dropped with with the uh, stock offering i mean not surprising in the sense that it's inherently a dilution but, uh, you know, do they win for just being a SPAC that's still standing, right? Yeah, stock still above dollar. So it's, that's a, a winner in our, in our post-SPAC mania. Uh, absolutely. They're there. And I'm sure Wing is waiting in the wings. And I, I'll, I'll stop now. I'll stop. <laughs> um, moving on from puns to uh, brews. Uh, <laughs> Luck and Coffee, the, the darling of Chinese caffeine eaters, is uh, reportedly coming to the U.S. So... Uh, Watch out, Starbucks. It's, it's already been a, a tough couple of years for America's coffee, darling, but uh, China's coming for your caffeine fix. Okay, so please remind me of the deal with Luckin. Like, Luckin had this major accounting scandal a few years ago. Um, also, I just find it interesting because they were like, they were supposed to be like ultra cheap and ultra delivery focused, of course. Like, that is their yeah, appeal here. So, of course. So, yeah, so what do, you know, where, where do you see them sort of entering the States here? What exactly is the news? Where do they, where do they penetrate the Starbucks? Uh, you know, fortress moat here and, and start worming their way in. Because I think it's interesting, like this couple with Blank Street, we've got VC back coffee chains. I think it says something about late, late, late capitalism here that like in the end, the only product category left is caffeination. Drugs. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, drugs are always a good business, folks. Um, no, it's, it's, uh, it's all still a little speculative, but it looks like they're going to kind of approach through U.S. markets with uh, large Chinese or Chinese American populations, people that might already be familiar with the brand. Um, not not a, a crazy plan there. So going into big markets like New York, L.A., S.F. Um, but uh, yeah, to your point, they were almost felled back in China when their crazy rapid expansion turned out to be kind of uh, underwritten by some light accounting fraud. But evidently, you can't kill a two dollar coffee. Yeah, I mean, I mean, under under the, put it under the heading of fake it until you make it. That is uh, the, the luck and experience there. Well, it, it will be interesting to see like how, how this differentiation happens, particularly with nickel. And yeah, I think as we pointed out last episode, like, you know, Starbucks has become like the teenage third place for getting your elaborate sugary drinks here. So, you know, opposite end of the competitive spectrum is to make it as fast and as cheap as possible if, if Starbucks is going to try to go back to being third places again. Brian's got his work cut out for him. He does. All, the, all those employees need somewhere to go for their coffee breaks as he's dragging them back to the office. So there you are. <laughs> 
Um, well, I want to revisit from from uh, from from the kite story from last week as well too. It's something that slipped through. I think I saw it in, in, in movements here, and it jumped out at me. Um, a, a small announcement here where Mapless AI, one of the let's say smaller players in the AI space, uh, is partnering with Arrow, which is a franchisee of, of Budget and, um, and I believe what was it Hertz or Avis it was one of the other two big duopoly there um, for basically helping teleoperate their fleet. And this this stood out for me because. Over the years, I've had a chance to like give talks to people like Element Fleet Management. Shout out to Element uh, that has like a million and a half corporate cars under management and fleet. Like this idea of using teleoperation, which I know has had its ups and downs, but I think it's interesting that like, is this the way that for particularly for like non deep pocketed players like a Waymo, which just raised another five point six billion dollars, uh, are actually going to sort of implement? the expectations of autonomy, right? Like delivering that car. Yeah. Like, you know, we talked about the smaller players like Kite and Upshift and others who might be pivoting to it or being crammed down on it. But there's just a lot of automobility out there being managed to various degrees where this becomes the norm and you do this. And McKinsey has its own report out on this or a short note that, that yeah, that Americans in general are, are totally open to the idea of remote driving where you tell them there's a human doing the driving that there's not the driver's seat. So I don't know. I'm, I'm curious about like, this is like, is this autonomy light going forward? Yeah, I, I mean, I share your bullishness on remote operations. Um, I think again, from the consumer's perspective, it's not about how it works, it's just about if it does what you're promising. So if something is driving the machine for me and there's no person there, do I really care? If it's a fancy computer or if it's someone in a you know developing economy, so labor arbitrage is a <laughs> classic business, and so if uh, minimum wage is a couple bucks in you know Ecuador, that's that's yeah. a lot cheaper than GPUs. <laughs> There you go. Well, speak, well, speaking of GPUs, or speaking of like, you know, how do you do cut rate autonomy? So what's the latest on <laughs> Tesla? This two things yeah. jumping out here. And what's what's the worst way to save money is to do a camera only solution. Um, this headline caught our eye because it's just, uh, I mean, thank gosh that it was a deer, but uh, a Tesla in FSD mode slammed into a deer without slowing, without stopping, without you know, acknowledging the presence of this, uh, you know, beautiful animal in its in its path. And even once it hit it, it continued going. There was no kind of impact detection sensor that went off. So, um, I mean, just think if it had been uh, a person or a, even a larger object that would, you know, hurt the, the car uh, occupants. So it's, it's scary what we're allowing out there. I was going to say, I don't think, I don't think uh, for legal reasons, I am not recommending industrial espionage, but man, if I were at any Tesla competitor, I would move heaven and earth to get that, uh, get a dash cam video of that because, you know, uh, slaughtering charismatic megafauna with your AV <laughs> is like a real PR killer to say the least. Uh, I have to imagine that Cruise is just like kind of letting uh, a gate open and thousands of uh, does are now roaming around the suburbs of Austin just waiting for their next uh, encounter. <laughs> there you go. Well, fortunately, you know, next next time it happens, there might be a Tesla employee inside of it because we also like news got out this week that apparently Tesla's been running an internal AV ride hailing operation for a year. Or so, uh, yeah. So, you know, who is Tesla using as guinea pigs in those experiments hunt, hitting deer? It would be his own employees. Again, filing under shocking but unsurprising. File file under what must be a long NDA. Yes, and those le those NDAs are in fact legendary over Tesla. So, yeah, but that's yeah. what it entails now. And well, all the more enforceable in Texas. <laughs> ex exactly. Well, speaking of of, of uh, Tesla aesthetics here, um, you have a fun item here where it looks like you know Cybertruck Cybertruck aesthetics, but at a much more affordable price and smaller package. Yeah, yeah. This this one's fun. I uh, always love a, a new kind of small scale. You know, is it micro mobility? Is it uh, a micro vehicle? What, what do you, whatever you want to call it, but. A new company called Infinite Machine just raised nine million bucks, uh, backed by Andreessen Horowitz, which I think is interesting. Not their kind of usual vertical, um, and I mean, you know, a podcast is worth a thousand words. But it's a very cool looking vehicle. It's a it's a moped with I guess you'd call it cyber trucky aesthetics, but that's just a bastardization of cyberpunk aesthetics, right? It's got the angle lines, silvery panels, very nineteen eighties future. So you know if, if Good design is what it takes to get Americans out of oversized vehicles. I'm all for it. Well, it sounds like a, it sounds like a good idea to me here. I mean, anything that gets beyond just like the Vespa, is, I mean, which is as classic as it gets, but you know, um, some alternatives to that one. But yeah, it's it's just funny to me that the the prevalence, the increasing prevalence of cyberpunk aesthetic, like it reminds me of the the comment from the vintage car market, which is you know you can really see which cars come into vogue based purely on. 
uh, are you now entering middle age with money and are you nostalgic for it when you were a child? And <laughs> yes, like all these middle aged Gen X dudes here are nostalgic for their Blade Runner and for their Neuromancer and now investing that aesthetic here. So um, I think fortunately the end of history comes after that. So I'm not really sure what aesthetic we get after Cyberpunk. But <laughs> yeah, ch- ch- check back in and if the podcast is just dead static, you'll, you'll know what's happened. There you go. The sky above the port, etc. Well, before we get to before we get to next week, speaking of you know the, the end times here uh, with our next next uh, week's episode here, which we're going to tape on election day, so we'll leave you in leave you in some suspense, I think, if you're listening to it after that. Uh, but first off, we have Halloween, so we actually have like legit scary here, and um, <laughs> the second scariest holiday coming up. <laughs> there you go, and you know no no one asked me for Greg's hot take corner, but I'm going to offer one anyway, which is to say, I think for the for our listeners here that the the new American tradition of trunk or treat is really the ultimate sign that your community is a policy failure. If if it is impossible for your children to trick or treat from house to house because either you're afraid of your neighbors or you're afraid of your children being hit by cars, um, yeah, like there's I think there's some re- real remedial work to be done in the American social fabric for that one. And not me to not me to cast shade on anybody here, but it is alarming to me that that's out there. And I think that should be treated like car bloat, like David Zipper's crusade against car bloat yeah. and others that, that, yeah, we've really let automobility culture get out of control. There's got to be some SUVs that are larger than um, studio apartments at this point. So <laughs> you can fit more candy in there. Just, uh, <laughs> it's just logical, Greg. I mean, definitely some Land Cruisers. I can think of some Lincolns. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, you're probably right here. You could probably actually... Uh, Fit fit an entire home inside some of them, but yeah, but yeah, but you know, but but you know, I here's here's to all the kids, heartfelt to all the kids there who have to go from from car to car this Halloween. I'm I'm gonna put the positive spin on it, where yeah, you know, for those of us that aren't in a trunk or treating community, um, yeah, just just go outside, even if you're not trick or treating, just think of it as like what a wonderful day when there's lots of people on the street, there's pedestrian traffic, there's people being neighborly, there's uh, you know, activations of uh, buildings that might not have a, a retail use, but all of a sudden they're giving out something people want. So, uh, you know, it's the mixed use urbanism that we all want. It just runs off of corn syrup. It's true. Spirit of Halloween. That's our ultimate backstop here for any retail vacancies. So God bless. <laughs> what will we do when it's gone? <laughs> uh, well, I think without further ado, let's chat with uh, the legend himself, Alex Roy. <laughs> and we're back. It's The Courier and we're here with Alex Roy. Hey, Alex. Great to see you, Jonah. Thanks for having me on. This is really a fun one because for those of you that aren't familiar, which is a really a shame for anyone that's not, Alex, you've got maybe the most amazing resume of anyone in the world. You've done it all. <laughs> you've you've raced, you've written, you've brought uh, you know ideas together, and now you're bringing funding together with your new projects. So um, maybe maybe give us a little brief bio. How'd you become such an amazing man about town? <laughs> I, I always feel my like my life is very boring, um, <laughs> but uh, I mean I guess I. A lifelong New Yorker until a few years ago. I, uh, you know, owned some real estate, opened a nightclub called The Box uh, with a friend like you know, almost 17, 18 years ago. Um, but probably best known for uh, breaking the Cannonball Run record in 2007. I was the first person in 25 years to do that. I wrote a book about it, went on Letterman, uh, got in a little bit of legal hot water, which kind of kicked off my accidental career. Uh, in technology and investing <laughs> because in my, I wrote a book about the cannonball run and how we broke the record, which came out around the same time as the DARPA challenge in 2007, 2008. And I didn't know it at the time, but that book was read by a lot of folks who were on the DARPA challenge. And so in the intervening years, you know, I was, um, chairman of the moth storytelling series. I became an angel investor. I, um, launched a website called the drive with my friend JF Musual and Chris Harris and Matt Farah. And, um, and then in 2014, you know, Tesla released uh, Autopilot. And I'd like, wouldn't it be cool uh, if the future was electric and maybe autonomous, uh, set the electric and um, uh, driver-assisted cannonball records, and uh, launch a podcast called, called the Autonicast, uh, which was focused on investing in, you know, electric and future mobility. And very soon it became a podcast a lot of folks listened to who were investing and starting companies who just didn't want to hear only Tesla content. And I had intended that podcast to be kind of a, basically a funnel deal flow for my angel investing while I was, you know, an editor at the drive.com. And in 20, uh, was it 2018, uh, Uber had a crash, uh, which killed a homeless woman named Elaine Hertzberg in Tempe, Arizona. I wrote a column about it, speculating on, on why that happened. And, uh, 
my conclusion was that it was not a technical failure. It was a human and organizational failure. Got a call from Uber. They tried to recruit me. I turned down their offer. Across the street was a company called Argo AI. Uh, the, I love the CEO, Brian Slesky. He's one of the great leaders of our time. Uh, and I, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse, which was pick a number and help me prevent a catastrophe like that which befell Uber from happening to us. I spent four years there. And when Argo shut down, I pivoted again and decided to launch a uh, strategic advisory firm and continue my angel investing. And that was maybe a bigger sea change than anything that happened before because I had seen the world through the lens of like startup guy. Yeah. And I had never been the guy who really actively helped startups. And having been in corporate life for four years, then going back, I had a completely different lens, like an, as if an optometrist, <laughs> the optometrist of business had like, <laughs> moved the lenses past my eyes and, and then connected all of them and everything snapped into focus. And that, I guess, is what led me here today to speak to you. Because every client I had had a similar problem. They had an interesting technology. And some of it was amazing. They weren't very good at telling their story, sometimes to themselves and potentially to investors, but certainly not to the world. And I didn't have a phrase for it or even, um, I, I didn't have a way of summing up what their problem was. But and for two years, I tried to help them and did some great work. And there were some great companies. And some of them have gone on to be very successful. A couple did not. And uh, a few months ago, I got a call from Patrick Hunt, ex Rivian head of manufacturing strategy. He said, let's start a seed stage fund. And I'm like, why would we start a seed stage fund now? <laughs> now is when all the C stage funds are dying. All, you know, the big funds are growing. Anyone who's not huge is going away. Why should we start a fund now? And he said, well, look, most funds, certainly the medium and smaller funds, don't really have um, veteran operators with like deep tech experience, certainly not in, in manufacturing. And, and then there's your half. I'm like, what's my half? He's like, well, you were the chairman of the moth. Surely you know more than that storytelling than anyone. And I sat and looked back at my life and I realized, why did Argo, which raised almost $4 billion, die? The tech technology was great. Operations was great. Never had uh, any major incidents or even minor incidents compared to other uh, self-driving companies. Amazing, and, yeah. And it became very clear that they had a narrative problem. Argo lived and died in obscurity. It never commanded its own narrative and it never rose to the levels of other AV companies in the media. And then I looked at all the clients I ever had and they had the same thing, the same problem. And so I, I looked at the companies that had gone from, you know, from startup to dominant in the last 20 years and made a list. I looked at the common characteristics and through the lens of narrative, not reality, narrative coverage in the media and time from inception of company to actual business dominance, traced it and mapped out the subcomponents and came up with this concept of narrative command. I called up Patrick Hunt. I said, Patrick, you know, the, the most important thing a fund can do to be relevant is have command of its own narrative. Why should it exist? And very clearly, we have a reason to exist. Too many startups with potentially great technology cannot scale manufacturing of those products. They haven't costed them out correctly early in the company. And by the time they are manufacturing, it's too late. It's very hard to unwind problems in manufacturing at scale. And Cakes already Patrick, baked. Yeah, Patrick, you know how to do that. We need to brand that. Let's call it operational mastery. It's a term that's been used by others, but not with absolute clarity and not as a lens for investing. So let's have two lenses through which we look at any startup. Operational mastery will be yours, and mine will be narrative command or narrative command potential. And narrative command is the idea that a startup in a new market, which is a, a, a semantic whiteboard, can uh, create a narrative vision for the entire market, create language for that market, create generic terminology or degenericize old terms and then genericize, regenericize them as their own, uh, create a community of stakeholders that are the best moat any company can have, better than any technology, and combined with a charismatic figurehead, become, create the perception of inevitability 
as they raise money through multiple rounds to get product to market that guarantees that inevitability in reality. Tesla is the obvious and best example of this, but they're not the only one. And so going market to market, I found many examples of narrative command. And I realized very quickly that of the you know, 50 some odd angel investments I'd made, I probably would have made only five if I had taken the narrative command lens. And then if I had put those companies through operational mastery as a lens, maybe it would have been three. And so wrote a column, uh, presented it at a uh, venture capital conference, um, and uh, people said, can we hire you to give us narrative command? <laughs> <laughs> and then you called and said, come on the show, let's talk. So <laughs> that's, timing's the everything. My, that's the story <laughs> of the last you know, 25 years of my life. But it, I'm now looking at my own life and almost everything through the lens of narrative command because most of what we see in here is narrative. And if we wait long enough, we find out if those narratives are true and then it becomes history. And so what the whole point of investing of, um, is to look for companies whose narrative can become reality, but it starts with having a great narrative. People confuse this with storytelling. It is not. Um, there are a lot of bad stories told well. <laughs> so that doesn't get you to command. It doesn't get you to reality or a business that scales. So that's, that there, that's, that's, that's where we are. I think that's clearly you're a man that also has some narrative command there. That was uh, a pretty <laughs> compelling thesis. Um, but yeah, but my first question is obviously when do you sleep? But um, Not enough. no, just to give listeners like an idea of, of trying to you know flesh out some of the examples, right? Like getting to the idea that something could be a verb, so you don't you don't T and C somewhere, you Uber somewhere, right? You don't home share, you Airbnb out your apartment. So yeah. those are companies that have narrative command. I'm, I'm presuming if I'm picking well, up what you're dropping yeah, here. Yeah, so you know, th you know, I was thinking well. I was thinking about the language. I mean, obviously, I started at autonomous vehicles and electrification because I, I come from transportation. And uh, this started to crystallize my mind um, that there was a real problem with language uh, in 2019. So in 20, in tw I was at Argo, and the word autopilot, um, kept re recurring uh, in questions from local and state level uh, elected officials and regulators whenever Argo team members would go out on the ground and say, well, we have Argo autonomous vehicles, we're doing X, Y, and Z. And they'd be like, oh, is it like Tesla autopilot? <laughs> and we'd be like, well, no, it's nothing like, it's nothing like <laughs> and Tesla. And your heart would sink. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and so I began, you know, like how, thinking about, okay, autopilot was a term invented uh, a little over 100 years ago. Uh, Sperry invented the first mechanical autopilot for aircraft. And for the next you know, 90 years, autopilot was basically, um, it was an aviation term, and then eventually was a maritime term. But there was, there was never used in, in ground vehicles until Tesla in 2014 released their driver assistance system. It was from an end fundamentally no different from existing driver assistance systems, except that it had a, a more liberal application of lane keeping <laughs> assistance. <laughs> we know where I'm going with this. And yes. so it became possible to take your hand off the wheel for intervals in 2014 of up to an hour, which in good conditions on a straight road enabled things like my Tesla cannonball run record where we're literally sitting there for an hour, no hands on the wheel. And so that people didn't understand at the time. I mean, people, I mean, journalists and, and engineering and safety experts, they understood that there was a problem with the use of this word in a passenger vehicle, uh, sure, a ground the, the passenger The lay vehicle. folk. Yeah. yeah. But they didn't understand the consequences of allowing it to sit uh, in common usage and enter the vernacular for years. And so the notion that an autopilot, which most people cannot define what an autopilot does, they think it's an automatic pilot that literally pilots set it and get out of the cockpit and the plane flies itself. It's designed to be monitored by a pilot. In, an, in, a, in a ship, it's designed to be monitored by a crew. And in a car, monitored by someone in the seat. But most people, there, I think there's like half a million pilots in the world, I mean, of planes in the world. And I don't know how many uh, you know, ship captains and you know, masters there are on ships, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very small fraction of total people on Earth. And so autopilot became conflated with automation and autonomy. 
And so people began going into car dealerships in you know 2015, 2016, Mercedes, 2017. Do you guys, do you have autopilot in your car? And Mercedes would say, no, we've got drive pilot. It's different. But it's all, <laughs> but maybe if the, if the salesman understood the words, he'd say, but it's also level two, just like Tesla. And they'd say, oh, so can I take off my hand, my hands off the wheel like Tesla? Oh, no. And so Tesla is, I mean, one of the few examples of a company that took a term that was a branded term, a Sperry term, sure. and became a generic term, and then degenericized it and made it their own. And then autopilot re-entered the public consciousness at scale as a generic term for the automation of a vehicle you could buy. And with the prefix auto linked also to autonomy, the conflation became complete. And so Tesla's semantic command of transportation of personally owned vehicles was solidified within a year or two. The only opposition to this came from uh, Waymo, which you know the Google self-driving division, Waymo began a project called Let's Talk Self-Driving. Argo launched a thing <laughs> Just called- Just as catchy. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, called uh, Ground Truth. And these were the first efforts to educate the public on, on the language of automation and ground vehicles. Both failed. Argo, well, the, Argo didn't get the, the uh, traffic it needed to, to do anything. And Waymo um, launched that site. And it was, by the way, they did exactly what they should have done, which was launch something. No one else was doing anything. And they launched the site. And at the same time as OEMs selling driver assistance, um, marketing teams uh, basically contradicted their own legal teams and engineering teams and began to put out ads that said, hey, you know, our, don't you want a self-driving car? And Mercedes had a great ad. It was introducing the new E-Class, a self-driving car from a self-driven company. <laughs> Who wouldn't want so, that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so self-driving in the media and, you know, in, with the rise of social media became conflated with autonomy and full automation. And Waymo quickly realized that they, that self-driving was not going to work for them because everyone thought that could, everyone was confused about whether it was driverless or uh, driver assistance. So they, they changed the name of the project to set, let's talk autonomous driving. And that worked for a few years but didn't get the traction they wanted. And then they just walked away from it altogether and gave up. Uh, on the assumption, I'm guessing, that product speaks for itself. Waymo today has the best and the, actually the only driverless robotaxi service operating in the United States. And it's a wonderful service they use every day. But they, they fought a noble fight and it didn't work and they walked away from that fight. And the rest of the sector just surrendered. And so today... Yeah. Tesla owns the language of anything associated with automation and cars, driver assistance, self-driving, autonomy, all of it belongs to, to Tesla. And that is just one component of their total narrative command, I'm afraid to say it, of transportation. Because combined with the other components, which imply Tesla is first and best to every solution in every part of the transportation chain, their language um, and messaging it is uh, baked into kids. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And so narrative command, if one of the components of it is the definite creation, definition and ownership of the language, which then enables your company and brand to live rent free in the heads of everyone who hasn't even considered buying your product yet. Because when they decide that they want to buy a product, yours is the default setting. And that is Tesla in this country. Not to go too far down the Tesla wormhole, because that could take us years. You don't have to, yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> what, uh, in that sense, it's the narrative command is, is theirs to lose, right? So oh, do yeah. you see last week's uh, big nothing burger event? Like, is that uh, a glimmer of them perhaps like slowly kind of losing that, that kind of tight hold on the community? So... Let's thinking as an investor and, you know, what I'm looking for in startups, um, you know, a, a startup um, in a vertical, in a new market, it's a whiteboard for them to seize narrative command by any means they can. Uh, when eventually a market becomes mature, there will be two or more companies uh, in that sector and their product ranges will align roughly with each other. 
And then there's a narrative equilibrium. The vision for the future of the sector is not owned by any one company. Multiple companies are now moving forward, competing towards a common vision. A great example, Airbus and Boeing, Ford and GM, and every other major car company in, in the West. Um, all moving towards a common goal. They're, they're, they have competing products, competing structures, but they are basically mirrors of each other. The every only every Coke has its Pepsi. Yeah, absolutely. And so in the case, so if you know a, um, I mean, the market for EVs and, autom and automated vehicles is not close to mature. It's barely begun. But Tesla retains command of that, even if what we saw was disappointing to some, an embarrassment to others, it doesn't matter because their command is still complete. They are ubiquitous. Or they own the language. Their vision remains the only one. There's no other car company or transportation company in the West that has a vision or messaging that even it lit, even could like sit in the shadow of Tesla a ever at all. Well, I'm going to say not ever, but currently now. So uh, you can, we can make fun of them, but it doesn't change the power of the, of their narrative command. You will, you'll know when, so, when something has happened, it'll be so obvious. The question won't need to be asked if they lost it or not, they will have lost it. And an, an example of that would be Boeing and Airbus. Airbus, uh, you know, was around in the uh, 70s and they launched the fly by wire and flight envelope protection systems, the the software layer in between fly by wire input and the output on an aircraft. They, they launched that in the early 80s. They had disaster after disaster, but eventually they uh, achieved a safety level that matched matched Boeing and it took Boeing. Mm, call it 40 years before their narrative command began to <laughs> decline. And well, I mean, that's not true, but about 20 years, because then Airbus achieved parity, and then event, and then in the last five years, they've had multiple crashes. Boeing today um, is in decline from a narrative standpoint. And Airbus, and this is the weird one, Airbus could, if they wanted to, if they wanted to, um, move up the command like pyramid, the narrative pyramid. They could move into a superiority position or even command, but command would require them to elucidate a fresh and clear vision for the future of aviation and transport that Boeing could not follow. Airbus has not done that, which suggests one of two things. Airbus is too conservative an organization to do so. They have a plan they don't want to tell us. Um, B, they don't have a plan. They're just sitting and waiting to see what happens. Or sure, C. Just, just, just watch the competitor go off the edge. Yeah, yeah. There, is, there could be a structural or a problem inside Airbus or potentially even a technical problem that they are afraid might see the light of day if they move into a more into the light of uh, narrative superiority. Because as you move up, the, I, and I create a little uh, cool graphic with a pyramid of narrative hierarchy. If you move from equilibrium up to superiority, the light of transparency is on you. I mean, there is no company with more media coverage in the world than Tesla. Because when you're in that position, you're alone. Everyone's looking. And so there, is no, there are no secrets at Tesla. We know every problem and most people don't care. But when you're in an equilibrium position in a market, multiple players, um, there's a lot that remains unknown. And I suspect that Airbus doesn't really want to bring more light to what's going on. And we have seen, if you sniff around, you'll see some stories about issues with the engines in their latest model, the new uh, 321neo. There could be, it could be much worse than we know. So we'll see. So applying this back to your, your personal sort of investment uh, mm -hmm. thesis, right? Uh, unless, unless you're shorting uh, Airbus. <laughs> no, no. I'm not, uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not an Airbus or, no. Ford, or Ford investor I, or I GM know, or Ford. I, I don't care. I so. know, I know. Uh, but I, I'm just sort of curious, like, is this, is the thesis that you are looking for companies that already have narrative command uh, and the no, dynamism no. Or, or that you help them establish okay. that? So we're seed and pre-seed investors. So it is... I mean, it is possible, and it happens often, that a, in a new market, there'll be two, three, four startups, seed, pre seed, sure. doing similar things. And they may, let's imagine they all had equivalent technical capability and maybe even prototypes. One of those people will be vastly more entertaining and charismatic than any of the others. And I would argue that even if their technology was inferior, that leader is more likely to take that company to unicorn scale. Because if there are fairly insignificant differences in the technology 
and funding are being equal. The leader who can speak and rally his own troops and investors and speak to the media directly will win. It is, I, I can't think of an example of a sector where a, an uncharismatic, bland team with good tech beat another team whose leader was a Travis Kalanick or, or Elon Musk. It, it just doesn't happen. And this is an evolution because in the last 20 years, the rise of social media, the power of one-to-one -one communication between a leader and the world um, is exponentially more important than it used to be. And when the only layer in between a company leadership and the world what were major media, then comms teams, PR releases, and everything else, the system, you were in a way bottleneck. The system was a bottleneck, and a charismatic leader would still be constrained by it. But without yeah. those constraints, with the decline of major media, that leader is, not, is unconstrained. And so you can see that narrative command as a concept exists across verticals and also in politics and on a nation state level. So you don't have to like Donald Trump. It doesn't matter what you think of Donald Trump. But there is no conversation about politics in the United States or the West or really anywhere in the world without him being brought up as context. Trump is context. He could drop dead tomorrow. Trump, the way he behaves, his system, system of communication and the, his disruption of the Republican Party and American politics is the context of all politics. And so that is exactly what narrative command is. The, in a business context, and for, as an investor, I don't expect a company to have it early C to precede, but its potential is an absolute requirement to receive money from our firm, which is New, new Industry Venture Capital. Without it, um, maybe, but the, the, the potential has to, starts with a leader who, if they don't have it, know they need it. And that is what I've been selling for two years in my strategic advisory business, Johnson and Roy. We didn't have a brand for it. We didn't see it as clearly as we needed to, um, maybe to accomplish our own goals. Uh, but it's very clear now because the instant we went public with the paper, it went viral. And now I am swamped, swamped in requests for, you know, advisory services to sell it. But it's not something you sell. It's something you have to teach. It's a way of thinking. Sure. And it goes back to the moth. Everyone has a story. That's the moth ethos. But that's a lie. The moth says that, and the moth is the world's greatest storytelling organization there ever was. Uh, the moth says that because the moth needed in the early days people to volunteer to get on stage and tell a story. <laughs> if you didn't say that, if you said, hey, if you've got a story, we're, we've got a, a stage for you, people get insecure, they get scared, they wouldn't do it. But you tell people, we know you've got it, all of you. We want to hear it. Then people come out of the woodwork. It's emotional. And then the moth would have to do the work, which is, well, in a slam event where you'd put your name in the hat, we'd have you know, dozens of names, we'd pick 10 at random, we'd rank them, the audience would rank them, and out of 10 people telling a story on any given night, one or two might be good, maybe none, but generally one. And then the moth would look at you know, people, you know, celebrities, authors, elected officials, and train them, pull the stories out of them, help map the stories, and they would rehearse, 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 and eventually you'd get the big moth shows where famous people would speak, sometimes unknowns, but every story in a curated moth show is literally magic. Yeah. And so using the moth lens and looking at startups, most startups don't have a story because they don't really have a product. They have like a, an idea. They think they, you know, they think they've got something they don't really, but the ability to explain something clearly in 15 seconds or less is everything. And if you can't do that, then you don't have a business. And yet businesses raise hundreds of millions without that clarity. So uh, that is what my advisory firm uh, teaches. It's one of the filters that our, my fund has, NIVC has. And you know, I will, as an investor, personally take responsibility for training these folks or teaching them if I believe in the company and they have the potential. But in the, since we renounced the fund three weeks ago, I've looked at dozens of companies, and you know within two minutes, you know actually more than like 30 seconds, if this person will ever be able to explain themselves. Yeah. The worst thing that I've seen, I see it over and over at companies of all scale, uh, is the notion that marketing, storytelling, PR, communication, all of it is just a box you tick 
throw enough money at it, and it's solved. Just, just a product you purchase, yeah. That's no different from a car company saying, throw enough money at the next generation you know, 6,000 SUX, and it'll be the greatest sedan in the history of cars. <laughs> and, and yet, to this day, um, it took, what, we're uh, 12 years since the Tesla Model S came out. And only now do, do we have competing sedans that are equivalent or better in only a subset of areas. There is nothing that is a total package of quality and UX as good as the Tesla Model S from anyone. Porsche Taycan ticks a lot of boxes, better in some, but not range, not UI, not charging network, lucid air, more comfortable, much more range. Again, charging network, charging UI, network. Uh, yeah. UI uh, you know, it's just, I mean, better in many ways, but the Model S is a complete and total and holistic and brilliant product, and it will be f for the rest of time. Um, and this is uh, 12 years it took. And that's because no matter how much money those companies threw at designing car with GM for everybody else, they didn't understand that you have to, another component of narrative command is to create the seminal product in your category. Not an equivalent product, not a catch-up product, the seminal product, which means it must raise the bar. And in the automotive business, that means it's more than a car. The app, the charging, if it's an EV, everything about it has to be holistic and total, or it is going to be inferior. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think um, that's got to be a fun value add that the firm brings, right? There's all sorts of investors say, oh, we've got an amazing Rolodex, or oh, we can you know, teach you media training, but uh, yours sounds like a lot more fun. <laughs> media training is, I mean, it's necessary, but it's, nothing, it's just another box to tick. I mean, what makes me sick, and I, I, mean, I sound like a, like a jerk here, but like <laughs> when I see the, word, the words futurist, or storyteller, or or thought leader, in a LinkedIn bio, I'm like, no. This so you, person, you weren't hanging out with uh, AOL Shingy then. <laughs> he's a nice guy. <laughs> he's a nice guy. A thought leader, by definition, is someone who says something new first. First, if if someone else already said it, and you repeat it, you didn't lead on anything. And that, you know, futurists, the only real futurists are the people building new technology. A person who talks about the future, who's never built anything, is not a futurist. And so you could go, oh, these words are so meaningless. And so many companies, startups, just, they, they just want to tick the box. Got to have a PR guy. Got to have a story. So need an evangelist. Just, just they, money to spend. Yeah, yeah, just money blown. And to, a VC, I have a lot of friends who are VCs, but... Very few venture capitalists, this is true of every, every type of firm, um, are creating value that someone else didn't create or couldn't create. Yeah. So. Uh, just, just to get into the, the boring nitty gritty for a couple of minutes, you know, talking about the fund itself, you know, are you guys just looking at mobility or broader focus? Or, tell us a little bit about uh, how the machine works. Uh, uh, we're doing seed pre seed. Um, I, I mean, we don't call ourselves American dynamism, but we're mainly focused on American companies, uh, supply chain, robotics, manufacturing, deep tech, defense, uh, elect, you know, power generation. I, I guess you could put us in the American dynamism camp, uh, <laughs> but know, someone I, already has narrative command of that term, right? <laughs> yeah, they do. And by the way, brilliant narrative command, uh, for sure. I mean, Andreessen and Sequoia, these guys, they I mean, but I would say actually the most interesting VC firm in terms of storytelling and narrative is Lux, Lux Capital. Uh, Josh Wolf out of New York City. It, coincidentally, and I didn't know this at the time, he and I are sim similar age and both went to a club called the Lemours, a metal club back in the 80s. Um, listen to metal. Uh, I met him once for two seconds. Coincidentally, not coincidentally, at the annual Moth Gala. Uh, his uh, his <laughs> wife is back. on the board of the Moth. Well, you know something... A litmus test for me when I was in, in media was I really, I, if someone claims to be a great storyteller um, and they have not listened to the moth at least once, or especially if they haven't heard of it, they're off the list. Your, your, your bullshit detector for, goes off, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're applying for a communications job at corporate America, you haven't heard of this, the moth. I mean, seven years ago, you maybe you had an excuse, but today... The moth is huge. And um, 
it to me it that's just that's table stakes it's table stakes because story structure everyone knows the three act story structure for film theater whatever it, you know story structure can be executed in 4 minutes i mean in 15 seconds no but in a minute a minute and beyond yes and so structure is essential and there's no better way of learning structure than listening to the moth but beyond structure you know and i i I was diagramming what makes stories magic, what makes narrative magic. If you, you can tick the boxes, you can have three act structure and a great storyteller, but none of that matters. If you don't have story audience fit, this product market fit story audience fit matters. And so you need to be telling the right story, to the right audience at the right time. And so this comes back to the, the absurd, the absurdity of, of the concept of thought leadership. So, because again, if you're not first saying something new, you've got nothing. So look at Elon Musk, the master first master plan, people ignored it or snickered. All four points were executed. The second one, two of the four have been executed. The third one is still in progress. There is no other company in transportation that's elucidated a vision of what the world could and should be and is executing on it. Uh, they are at best car companies. What is the vision of a car company? Sell some Make cars. More cars. Sell some cars. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, GM had this interesting thing called zero, 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 uh, zero deaths, zero traffic, uh, zero pollution. And when I, the first time I saw it, I said, well, that's impossible. How could a company selling four wheel transportation with, uh, with any power, uh, powertrain ever make it, achieve those goals? It's impossible. Someone over, uh, they jumped the shark there. And yeah, then some, I someone, out. someone in the marketing department yeah. made that, not someone so, in the product department. <laughs> and then I was, I was having a conversation about this, and the guy across from me is my old friend Joel Johnson, is one of the most brilliant media people, business development people, audience growth people, and just strategists I've ever met in my life. And he says to me, he's like, I wrote that. I'm like, you wrote that? He's like, well, of course, because that is a great like vision. That's a great vision. And I'm like, well. Was it your idea that they should make that like their public facing like goal? <laughs> He's like, absolutely not. I told them not to. And as a result, I'm no longer there. And so <laughs> there is the difference between a Tesla master plan and a GM 000, you know, uh, vision is that the master plans that Musk is putting out are achievable on some timeline. Whereas the 000 messaging coming out of GM is never achievable by them. Because the goals of zero deaths, if, if every vehicle GM sold uh, was, you know, autonomous, um, you know, autonomous bubble that no matter what, the occupants sure, could not be injured. Five miles per over. hour. Yeah. Yeah. And if they struck anything, they're protected too. They, uh, well, they still couldn't achieve it unless GM was the only car manufacturer on the planet, which they never will be. It defies logic. And it also would mean it's eliminating. Yeah. It's not credible. Eliminating the Corvette and every human driven vehicle they have. And, and then you get into the pollution. Well, there's pollution somewhere else in the chain. And then traffic, like traffic is not, people think that traffic is a, um, an indicator of failure. It is not. Traffic is an indicator of success. People want to be there. <laughs> they sure. want to be there or somewhere near there and go somewhere near there. Now, the nature of traffic the speed at which traffic flows is a different story. The throughput of humans through a congested area, that's a different debate. And so what does zero traffic even mean? <laughs> Where's it, the traffic's got to go somewhere, yeah, yeah. preferably onto trains <laughs> and bicycles and, and the sidewalk, but there's still going to be traffic. So that is not a narrative command component, the, the, a statement like that. It, and it's actually quite naive that they still use it. Yeah, and, you know, and, a world yeah. with zero traffic and, and zero fatalities sounds like everyone's already dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah people, you know, so, you know, there are a lot of stories. Most of them should not be told. Just like there are a lot of, <laughs> look, Hollywood, I mean, I used to be in entertainment. <laughs> I was a screenwriter. Um, why do most movies suck? They follow all the rule, rules of story structure. They have unlimited budgets, hundreds of millions thrown behind them. And yet the movies suck. And it's a combination of failure. Uh, I mean, they're just bad stories told perfectly to the wrong audience at the wrong time. And that is, that is the history of business pitches and product releases as well. It's a story as old as time. 
Yep, yep. <laughs> Sorry, Adam Driver, but uh... <laughs> I love Adam Driver. <laughs> um, he's in a lot of things that are beneath him, but when he, he nails it, he's good. So, um, well, I, I think um, just sort of trying to sum up my own thoughts here. I, I feel like there's almost like a, a tautology here that I love. It's like I feel like by coming up with this term, you've already you've like nailed your own thesis, right? Like this <laughs> this feels like you finally have given a word to something that didn't exist before, and in, in startups I've worked at, I've always felt like sort of grasping for something there. Just just go into old history, like when we were making Turo and mm-hmm. there was no sense of sharing cars or even sharing anything yet. It's like, how do we get people to talk about this, right? Like, how do you how do you shift the mental paradigm? Well, you know, Turo is an interesting example because they 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 have narrowed a command of peer to peer, you know, car sharing. They have it at least in this country. Yeah. Um, but they did not achieve it by the same methods as Tesla. Um, part of theirs was you know time was you know great business model charismatic leader a brand shift as well as um as well as creation of the seminal product experience because as soon as they got rid of the dongles <laughs> like they unlocked <laughs> frick they unlocked opportunity oh that their competitors did not yet see and so Turo um they absolutely have narrowed a command of that and I'm proud of them and Andre Haddad is a great he's a great figurehead um and so I, I'm happy for them there are you know there are not a lot of companies that have been able to, I don't think we'll ever be able to duplicate what Tesla did, sure. but their companies have narrowed a command by default. So Redwood Materials, you have J.B. Stra- uh, Straubel comes out of Tesla. He brings the, the Tesla halo with him and that Tesla halo combined with the, his own like uh, reputation for authoritative competence combined with um, a big vision solution for battery recycling a lack of obvious competition in doing so at scale. Uh, and then the absence of companies attempting to replicate what he's doing at the same time uh, gave him narrative command almost by default. Like off the top of my head, I can't tell you what the seminal language is ar- around battery recycling. But ask anyone in the street and they would say, oh yeah, well, this is the ex-Tesla guy. He's got, he's, you know, that, that guy. And they can't name him, but if you sniff around, it's him. And who, yeah. who else is there? And you can go on to Anduril is another example. Disruption of defense. Anduril hasn't actually done that much yet. But he had both the halo of creating Oculus, leaving Facebook, coming over, being very entertaining, literally colorful in his outfits. Yeah, yeah those and, shirts. <laughs> and Palmer Lucky, when he comes out and goes after uh, you know, Jason Calacanis from the All In podcast, he is now um, doing something that... Um, Musk has done, but many other leaders don't do. He's put himself um, up as, uh, against a, um, he's created a bit of a straw man because Jason is not, what is Jason Calacanis doing that affects Palmer in any meaningful way? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. But Calacanis is a big audience. So when he says something, criticizes Calacanis, he, the entire audience is paying attention, solidifying Palmer and Lucky's narrative command. Now, a counter fact or counter narrative here is I invested in a company creating cruise missiles. Uh, called Aries Industries. They're a Y Combinator company. And uh, all they do is missiles. And they call themselves, I think they call themselves the missile company. All they do are cruise missiles. One model of cruise missile is currently you know, on the roadmap. And they're ra- they've raised a little bit of money. They just came out. Of- they're still in YC. Up against and people, or at least people have said, well, why would you invest in them? How could they survive? Andrew exists. Well, Andrew does a lot of things, but Andrew has not yet solidified their place as the company whose reality matches their narrative. These, Tesla hasn't either. Sure. It's been 20 years. <laughs> Tesla has the best shot at doing so. I am confident that Andrew will become a, 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 a foundational permanent company in the defense space. Absolutely. But that doesn't prevent a company that specializes in a subset of what Anduril does, that, like Ares, that only does one thing perfectly and executes that perfectly from existing. And in fact, sometimes competition, that there is a competitor that's bigger and stronger, becomes the perfect mirror off of which one's narrative can be amplified, if yeah. one is smart about it. And so I, without hesitation, wrote a check to Ares. I like the people. I like the product. I like where they are. I love the timing. And um, I love that they're just the missile company. 
so obvious. What does Andrew <laughs> do? Just rolls off the tongue. It's just the missile <laughs> company. And, uh, and the timing is right, too. So I could not be more optimistic about the future. And I am hopeful that the idea of narrative command saves a lot of investors and companies a lot of money. And it gets better companies out and the weaker companies just off the map sooner. Because that, that's just, it's a waste of time and money when the market doesn't have clarity about what's real and what's not. Alex, it was an absolute pleasure chatting with you about all this. I, I feel like we could go for hours, but um, that's, that's the narrative command you have. I'm, I'm just kind of enraptured here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much. And um, great to see you always, Jonah.